welcome to Citizens Forum. I'd like to start by thanking our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every uh, couple of weeks. Um, we're going to start off talking about, I think, proportional representation and the media. Today is uh, Wednesday, November the 7th. Um, proportional representation, the referendum, the role of the media, maybe the role of the NDP, um, and everything around that. Uh, so, Mehdi and Walt, Mehdi, why don't you start off? Uh, I, I just think that, you know, we, are in, we, are, we have a very important decision to make, and there is a lot of uh, de 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 deception is going on in terms of misinforming the public and, and the fear-mongering that is going on in media about uh, not to change, about the change and persu persuading people not to change. You know, it's, it's not that difficult. It's very simple things. The people in New Zealand did it a few, few years ago, and then after two terms with the change into proportional representation, they had another referendum, and they voted to keep the new system because they saw it work much better for, 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 their, for their needs. The problem with the present first-past-the-post system is just let's look at the two elections we had recently, one in Ontario. Yeah. The election in Ontario, the turnout was, uh, was about 58.4% of eligible voters voted. And the, the PC, the, the Progressive Conservative, got by 40.49%. 40, 40.49% yeah. of the, that 58.5%, yeah. they got a super majority with 76 out of 124 seats of the, the legislature. Now they can do whatever they want with that vote. You know what does that mean? That 40.49% of 58.5% is only 23.6% of the Ontarians that could have vote, voted for the progressive conservative. And they call that majority, a stable government. Majority, which majority? This is not majority, only 23.6% voted. Yeah. And a stable, a stable for who? The problem is that the big business and corporation don't want change. The reason they don't want change, they have the control of our government in their hand. You see, when when uh, we had 16 years of the liberal government, what's happened in that 16 years? They created $150 billion debt for the people of British Columbia. And I bet with you, if you go outside, talking to the people, 100 people, 99.99% .99 of them don't know that they have such a debt created for them. And they, we, they and their children have to pay we are going to be fleeced. Yeah. And that is why we have this system is being, uh, they want to keep this system. It doesn't matter. We, you had liberals, that's what they did. And they gave a, a lots of money to corporations. For example, $700 million transmission line to, to Northwest. Yeah. And it was our money that given to a, to a, to a mining, mining industry for nothing. We had, we, had, we had 16 years of the liberal, and then we got NDP uh, in this, this so-called coalition. And what happened? During those, uh, we saw that the, the new government come and support C Dam, the same thing that the liberals wanted. And another, another issue was, was the issue of LNG, and we saw that they support LNG, the same thing that the liberal was doing. Both of these two issues, two, to, to important to, to these two projects was pushed by corporate interests. So corporations are in control, and that's why they don't want a new system that reduce that control of uh, their control in our, in our government. I agree with you 100%. I think that the system we have is the easiest for them to control. And I think that's exactly the reason why the people at the top, and I don't mean the politicians, I mean the people who really run this province, which is corporate Canada, they don't want change because what we've got works perfectly for them. And they're funding the no side and they own the media. And uh, we're hearing a lot of negativity in the media, especially here in Victoria on CFAX radio. 
Yeah, in, in CFAX, it's very interesting. We have a, a morning show between 9 and 12 by Adam Sterling, and he is relentless in misrepresenting the, the PR system and, sub, and, and opposing it and, and creating you know, fear and opposition to it in the public mind. For example, in one day, October 25th, he said, you know, I have been remind, reminded a lot over the last couple of weeks about the pipeline campaign. You know, when you were misled by a bunch of environmentalists, as well as people who should know better, they told you a bunch of things that were not true about the pipeline. I told you the truth every day in this radio station for six months. And in the end, you all saw who is telling the truth because it's got stopped for exactly the same reason. So what he's telling people that he is telling the truth, the environmentalists were telling you a bunch of lies, but he never specified. That's absolute nonsense what he is saying. In fact, what he said to the people about pipeline, he said that the Royal Society of Canada report, 2015, said in page 160 and 376 that we can clean up Betjeman if there is a spill in the ocean, and we have done it before, and we cleaned up the whole thing easily. The Royal Society of Canada report, 2015, I have a copy of it here, never said such a thing in those pages. Mr. Sterling either cannot read scientific paper, or he is misleading and lying to the public. What, what the Royal Society of Canada in page 160 said, he said, based on unpublished report, that means unverifiable information. And Mr. Sterling never said that. Besides that, this is the only Royal Society of Canada report that there is a qualification right on the first page. And what it said in the first page, Royal Society, the opinion expressed in this report are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent that those of the Royal Society of Canada. Mr. Sterling never told the public that that qualification is there. And at another thing, there is a good reason that qualification is put there. The whole report was commissioned by oil industry. And, that, and they paid for the report, and they paid, and they, they set up the terms of reference. He supported the pipeline, corporate interest. He supported the site C dam, corporate interest. He is opposing the change of electoral system, corporate interest. He is a really a sock puppet of corporations, every day there, pushing the corporate agenda. There are many, many uh, examples that I can read, but I just read one here from May Terriot. He said, so I am glad that federal government is trying to actually put its mouth where its, uh, its money, where its mouth is is in a sense, and not through the, na the natural resources industry to the wolves. You and, know what? Sorry, and not, and not, not through throw, the, throw the, the natural, natural resource industry, industries to the wolves. To the wolves. And, <laughs> and when he said that, it was when the government sure. announced that they are buying the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline. Yeah. So yes, give $4.5 billion to natural industry resources and not put them into the wolf because they are my bosses probably because, I mean, who said such a thing? Who says such a thing? Well, funnily enough, they are his boss because the CFAX is owned by Bell Media, which is owned by Bell Canada. And the CEO, I'm sorry, the chairman of the board of Bell Canada, I think his first name is Gordon, Mr. Gordon Nixon. So he's, he's the chairman of the company that owns CFAX. It's a huge corporation. And his former position was as CEO of Canada's largest bank, the Royal Bank of Canada. So, in fact, that is who CFAX works for. And when CFAX and the rest of the media tells you that they are your friend and they're working in your interest, which they often say on, on CFAX, don't necessarily believe them because they don't work for you. They work for the banksters and they work for corporate Canada because that's who owns them. And that's what we're up against here, folks, not only on the issue of PR, but on every other issue as well.
you know, he, he, on October 25th, I already quote one of them, but in less than one hour, he's telling three times to people, you remember the pipeline? I was telling you the truth, the, the other guys, the same people now that uh, told you lies about the pipeline, they are telling you lies about proportional representation. He said this, so you know, what I expect the proportional representation side get really nasty. I expect people to threaten me and the people try to intimidate me, to stop me telling the truth to you because this is about the power and when people have power imbalance, they get super ugly. You know what? It is not going to work. Do, do your worst. I will tell people the truth. I, I told people the truth about the pipeline. I will to I was totally vindicated. Who vindicated you? We asked you to come there and have a debate. We show you your own words that you misled the public, Mr. Sterling. If you don't want us to come to your show, you come here with me. We will go at it. Your own words. If you want, I have, the, I have also electronic recording of all your shows since May, May of this year. And we can put your own words on air. And we let the people decide who is telling the truth. Stop your nonsense. Stop attacking environmentalists. Stop attacking people that are honorable people, want the public to know the truth, and stop pushing the corporate agenda. Walt, was that well said? <laughs> well, you, you covered so much territory there, but for me, um, you know, in a democracy, you know, say, say the expectations, what you would have in a democracy is the ability to gather information. Uh, and we know what we're up against with the, with the corporate media. It's not a surprise. But we're, we don't have any of the buffering effects, say, of good information coming from the universities, for instance, or uh, from other sectors. You know, there seems to be such a dominance now of information coming from that corporate source that that in itself, no matter what type of electoral system we have, still going to be, still going to be a problem for us. Oh, the course. good thing is... With the, with the proportional representation is that the, the, the members of the Legislative Assembly that have to get together and discuss these things, have to work out these problems, they are hip enough to know that they can't rely on Adam Sterling and these other sources. And we could get a little further into, drill down a little further into the issues and, and come up with long-term solutions, not things that just fit for one or two years, but something that's going to aid development for the next couple of generations. Another fraud that they are perpetuating is the fact that they say it's an open line. I call and I'm, they put me on wait for more than an hour, never take me on. So if, and, and at the same time that I'm waiting, he's telling the people, I like to be challenged. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know? This is, this is fraud. And it's a fraud that CFAX and Adam Sterling perpetuating on daily basis on the people of this, this city. Mehdi, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. That's, uh, the, the, the corporate control of the media is a huge problem for us all. Thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. I'm Dan Mangan, and right now we are in the middle of a referendum that could really change, for the better, how our electoral system works. We have a really old, archaic system called First Past the Post, which worked really well a couple hundred years ago, but now it doesn't make any sense. Under proportional representation, if you get 40% of the vote, or 60% of the vote, or 20% of the vote, that's how much power you get. No more voting for the person you kinda like instead of the person you really like because you're worried about the person you really don't like getting in. Right now, there is a ballot. It might be in your house already. It might be in your mailbox. It might be coming to you very shortly. You check proportional representation. Yes, I want proportional representation. No more first past the post. There are a couple different options of kinds of proportional representation. Any of them would be better than the system that we have right now. If you need to leave that blank, you can do that too. It's okay. Vote yes. Go ahead, do it. Make sure you get it in the mail. You don't even need a stamp. Please, proportional representation. Vote yes. Do it. Referendum. Ballot. Mail. Snail mail. No stamps. Just do it. Thank you.
Welcome back to Citizens Forum. Uh, this is the Walt and Jack segment of the show in which we touch on several issues and topics that are affecting us every day. Um, and Jack's going to make some comments on a few issues also. Um, Jack, uh, we just had the U.S. midterm elections. And uh, the uh, Democrats survived uh, the midterms. They, they gained some seats. But how do you view this uh, election? Does it, does it change the any of the... Uh, complexities that are going on in the United States or is it just adding to what they already have for problems? Personally, I think both the Democrats and the Republicans just work and are controlled by corporate, corporate America or whatever. There's so, at the federal level, the President and the Congress, the, the House of Representatives and the Senate, I don't think there's any democracy left there. There may be a few good people in there, but they're overwhelmed by the other 95 uh, senators and 400 odd Congress people, you know, yeah. it, it's just the poor American people. I feel so sorry for them. The media is totally corrupt down there. The, the you know, and, and the goal seems to be to divide everybody and get people literally fighting in the streets. That seems to be where they're taking people, and everybody's on board with that uh, with that plan. Nobody speaks against it. That is is a strange thing. Is that the, the inability, you have these two solitudes. Um, you have uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, but, but we're not really talking about that other, the main ideology that's driving U.S. society as well as Canada. And uh, pu the public aren't really figuring it out. I mean, this, uh, with the Democrats, uh, they don't know why they lost to Donald Trump. They still haven't figured it out. Uh, they should have had huge gains in this midterms, as far as I'm concerned, with all the things that this guy has done. But they did okay. You know, they gained some seats and took control of the House, but it doesn't really mean a whole lot in the, in the big picture. And I don't think they're figuring it out fast enough to defeat Donald Trump in the next next presidential election. So when you think about it, uh, as you say, the, the Democrats and the Republicans seem to be in on the game. And, and I really think that that's the big deal, is that the corporatist ideology that drives both of those parties uh, is what allows the corporate media to manipulate this, the scenario to the point where you have Donald Trump satisfying 60 million Americans voted for him. And it, they're not all nut bars, you know. No, I would say, I, I, I wouldn't say that about his supporters. I mean, I think his supporters are good people, you know. Yeah. I, I think they, you know, it, things are just, things are just so crazy, you know. Well, it's, they're, in, they're in a crisis, and I, we went to see um, Fahrenheit 11.9 uh, by Michael Moore and, and uh, a follow-up of Fahrenheit 9.11, and, and you know, he is terribly concerned and frustrated right now with what's transpiring. And he thinks that this is sort of like the end game where uh, we're going to end up with a Trump presidency for another four years. And God knows what's going to happen after that. And he's making dire predictions. And we may be into a big change in the United States. They could slip into some type of fascist regime quite easily at this point. And we're also on the verge of uh, seemingly environmental disaster uh, on many, many fronts. And plus, you know, a lot of people question how the U.S., I mean, the amount of debt, everything is built on debt, and yet the stock market has never been higher. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens over the next few weeks. This is being filmed on November the 7th. You know, when people start to watch this, we'll see if any impact is is beginning to happen. Well, we we get, there's always hope for change, and maybe enough people in the United States will start to figure it out that uh, had they elected Bernie Sanders, they would have been a lot better off. And why we don't have Bernie Sanders is because Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party decided that they were not going to allow Bernie to to win the nomination. That's right. It was Hillary Clinton. The people who run the Democratic Party and the media yeah. together. They just sidetracked Bernie. They pushed him off to the side because Bernie represented a message that they 
don't, the people who run the country don't want to hear. And, and so that message was pushed aside. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, uh, Bernie allowed the message to be pushed aside. Uh, and really, it wasn't his message. It was the message of all those millions of people. The movement was there. Bernie came forward one way or another to take control of the movement and then really just step back and let the power structure destroy it or push it to the side. You know, he could have, he could have done so much more. It's unfortunate because I think people on all sides wanted to hear what Bernie had to say. Yeah. And he stepped back from... Well, he's not gone. And they, he, he's affecting American politics quite profoundly still. And uh, they're doing a lot of grassroots organizing and things of that nature. It's a, gr it's a good development to have Bernie Sanders around. And, uh, you know, it shows just the hypocrisy and, and just how decrepit the Democratic Party is. Oh. That they, can't, they can't represent their own values that they claim to have in their own constitution of their party. So it's a tough way to go. Now, I was going to mention also um, uh, Donald Trump is uh, now sending 5,000 troops down to the Mexican border to keep uh, this horde of, uh, of refugees from entering the country. And he's, he's got the troops there putting up barbed wire and protecting the country from these people who are going to be applying for uh, become uh, refugees, I guess. Refugees. The that they States. have a refugee status. Uh, it's going to cost the American public around $75 million to send the troops there. Now, if they just took that $75 million and just spent it on helping people from fleeing terrible circumstances, uh, I think the money would be better spent. And I have a feeling, although I don't know, that a lot of the terrible circumstances in Central and South America were deliberately caused by the people who run the United States. They've destabilized governments, they've stolen wealth in untold amounts, they've destroyed entire countries. You know, this is what the CIA and the United States and the, the World Bank do. And they've created a nightmare down there. And good people, they're, they're just afraid for their lives, so they're fleeing. And that's the part of the story we never hear. I mean, it's absolutely, you know, it's bizarre. Yeah. So what have you brought in, Jack? I see you have a clip here in, in, on your paper, uh, paper there. About a year ago, I bought uh, a food product at Thrifty's. It was called Ital Italissimo. It, they make little jars of, of stuff. This was something you can spread on bread. It was like it had olives in it or something. But I wanted something that was low calorie. So I read the label. It said uh, 30 calories per cup. So I saw, great, that's what I want. I took it home. The first time I tasted it, I thought something's wrong here. But I bought a second bottle. But I knew something was wrong. So I contacted... Um, Canadian Food Inspection Agency. I said, this can't be 30. Oh, I phoned up Italissimo. And they said, oh, yeah, we'll put our quality control people on it, you know. And I thought, like, I found out in, like, one tasting that there was something wrong here, but yeah. you're quality control people. Anyways, it's not 30 calories a cup. It's really, I think, Canadian Food Inspection Agency said 30 calories for two tablespoons, right? That's, that's wow. the real amount. So, but the label hasn't changed. The label has, it, it, nine months later, maybe it's changed now, but for nine months it didn't change. And as far as I know, it still hasn't changed. And that's the disdain which everyone has for the people of Canada, right? Yeah. Just lie to everybody, who cares? What CFIA, Canadian Food, they said, well, we're going to wait till they run out of labels. <laughs> so let them mislabel until... Until they run out of well, labels. Well, those labels are very, uh, yeah, yeah, very yeah. expensive items. It's I just present. pathetic. The whole, and that's how the whole country is run. Yeah, and there's no penalties by you know, the, and for any of that false advertising, it, it, there's no regulations there to protect the public. And if there is any, they're sure, surely not going to enforce them. No. I want to ask you about 5G. Now, yeah. I, aside from knowing you, I wouldn't even know what 5G meant. But essentially, the various companies, I don't know who they are, Telus is one, are rolling out new transmitters that are being put on all of our streets. They're like mini cell phone towers. Mm -hmm. And I, is it one for every one or two square blocks? Is that how many of them there are? There'd be more transmitters than that. More the, than one per, like one every block, basically. Are you saying that? I would say one per, per every, 
block length of street might be good enough. Uh, Brentwood Bay uh, on the water side going down to the water, they have uh, uh, around 110 transmitters on that, that side, which is a, a real blanketing of, of transmitters. Now, is this stuff potentially bad for the health of everyone who's being exposed to, or will be? Is it turned on yet? No. Okay. Uh, they are planning on turning it on. I haven't gone and tested it, so I can't be sure, but uh, it, it's, it's being rolled out, and it, we'll be able to test for it and see what, how, how powerful the signal is. Can we say this is potentially bad for people's health? Well, ask the World Health Organization, or the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is a global, the preeminent research group that sets standards on exposures to toxic substances like dioxins and furons and mercury and, and electromagnetic radiation and also electromagnetic radiation now they sit they classified uh, this type of radiation as a radio frequency radiation as a class 2b type carcinogen so it's a carcinogenic agent according to international research uh, uh, international agency for research on cancer the thing is, is that these people are the ones that set the guidelines and, and set the, the regulations that are accepted globally, by usually by all other governments in the world, that they take heed. Like if you say a type 2, 2, 2B carcinogen is like dioxin, is like mercury. And, and, and so if you start talking about those substances, everybody knows you stay away from that. That's, that's, that's a dangerous Thing to be exposed to but people don't realize that the radiation that's coming off their, their own cell phone is in that same category now the thing is about the 5g uh, technology is that people choose to put a phone to their head let's say so there is a certain amount of individual choice but there's no choice here the people of these neighborhoods are going to be ir irradiated 24 hours a day seven days a week unknowingly for the most part without having any input in, into the discussion so this is fundamentally and morally wrong you know in a society in which we should have a chance to have a say in, in something that's polluting our environment and poisoning our children well possibly so so possibly or possibly or well is poisoning is is a okay. result of exposure right so a certain level of exposure would give you some sort of toxic results for sure. Um, so we have to look at that carefully and, and know that this is happening worldwide and uh, it could have some very serious consequences for the public. In, in and the this is going to be throughout the greater Victoria area and everywhere else I guess. Wherever they choose to, 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 to do it. Is it being put up now in Victoria? There are places in Victoria where they're operating at another system that's similar um, and it has these local neighborhood sort of uh, transmitters uh, and there has been concerns and people have been have uh, reported ill health effects so so we'll just compare the coverage given to that story compared to the coverage yeah. of you know whatever crap the media chooses to to tell us about I mean you know there's so much trivia and sports and crime and violence and coverage of Trump I mean when they won't even tell us that the corporations that own the media are coming into your neighborhood and poisoning your family. That somehow they never find room to tell you, but they have us worried about everything else and fighting each other and blah, blah, blah. That's the game they play. It's a dirty game, but that's the game they play. And as long as they've got the power and the control, they're not going to change. Okay, so on that note, Jack, I think it's not a very happy note. <laughs> well, it's but a happy note in that we have to know what we're up against. We're going to follow this story. When there's more to report on it, I, I certainly will come in and, and give you more information on it. So uh, that wraps up this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back to Citizens Forum. I have with me today uh, Louis Guibault, and Louis is a, is a transit advocate and a, and a fellow that's been studying... Uh, the relationships between uh, public transportation and automobiles and how they all affect uh, our urban environment. So welcome to the show, Louis. Well, thank you, Walt. Good to be here. So uh, I think, you know, we should just get right into this. And, 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 and I, I, you sent me some information about uh, some of the points that you think should be made in this interview. And uh, 
I think we could, if we just get into that idea of what is the relationship between roads and freeways and parking lots and high housing costs. Well, look at Victoria. Ho housing is astronomically expensive in Victoria. Yeah. Homelessness is a huge problem. But then if you look, look, at, look, at Victor look at downtown, look at where we are right now. Look yeah. at how many parking lots. We're surrounded by parking lots. That land is used and is, it's empty three quarters of the time. Yeah, and, and it's all service. It could be you could put housing right right here. I mean, yeah. So there's tons of land, but but we insist on using it for sticking cars for a small fraction of the day. Yeah, it's even, crazy. even roads. If you look at roads too, that, look at Blanchard Blanchard yeah. Street, which was made into a freeway back in the '60s. Yeah, which I drove in on today, which was busy. But many most times there's nothing on those. There's roads. nothing on Blanchard. So if you think about that, huge expanse of land, yeah, which is which is is only used, for, it's only busy for about four hours of the day, yeah, basically. So I mean, you you also mentioned here that uh, you have a topic here called the transportation pizza, and you're saying that we need uh, a and more of an equal split of exactly. the pizza pie exactly. between the cyclists, the the, the transit uh, people that are riding transit. The walkers and the, and the automobiles, yeah. because those are the four big things we see. That's right. The pizza in Victoria, the pizza is about about sixty percent, sixty seventy percent for cars, yeah. basically, and then a little tiny piece for for cars and walkers, uh, pedestrians, yeah. and transit and uh, bicycles, right? Yeah. But a city like Freiburg in Germany, very wealthy city, yeah. but it's the it, the four the pizza is more even more equal. Yes, yeah. it's much it's much more equal than here. That's right. You know, it's the, the way it's structured. I mean, uh, everything comes into town. Yeah. The workers come into town. Uh, all the government employees are coming in. Yeah. Every morning, you're shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. Coming that's in, right. And there's so much time being wasted there. There is. And there's so much money being spent on all those cars. It's really yeah. quite remarkable. Anyway, so uh, you were touching on. Uh, the issue around underground parking, for instance, right, would, right. is that an expensive proposition? It's it's astronomically expensive. Uh, I I don't even know what the average, but if you look at that the, the new Hudson project, yeah, they had to they dug down, what fifty feet in, yes. into the bedrock, to put in underground parking for this new tower going up. Every yeah. every parking stall is what is fifty or seventy five thousand dollars. It's it's it's, it's, a, it's astronomical. Just look it up. Look it up. Yeah. Imagine if we built uh, some some condos or apartments downtown that didn't even have parking and, and just just put people in. Yeah. What, a, what a concept, eh? Housing yeah. for people and without it, there would be people who would be happy to rent or buy housing units without yeah. parking. You know. Now I think this is like you know we're kind of kind of in the middle of the problem because it, here we are, uh, transportation is more or less part of an overall development scheme. Right, right. And if you're not providing the other key components, then then the transportation scheme that's more environmentally friendly really won't work or really isn't needed. Mm -hmm. Right now, everybody's living out of town in the suburbs, right, more or right. less, and driving in every day. Yeah, not everybody, because there is a lot of new housing coming in downtown. Yeah. But, um, Unfortunately, almost all the housing has, downtown housing has underground yeah. parking. You know, um, the thing is about efficiency. Right. I mean, we're not talking only talking about uh, just spending less time in your car and things right. of that nature. But in fact, how when you want to move something from point A to point B, uh, the, I don't think the public is really aware of, of how inefficient automobiles are, rubber on on, on, on pavement right. as compared to other types of transportation. That's right. Rubber on asphalt is, is, is extremely inefficient. Why does, every, why does Canadian Pacific, Canadian National, Union Pacific, all these railroads, they don't run on rubber uh -huh. because that would be stupid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They run steel on steel because the rolling coefficient of friction yeah. is much lower and it's more efficient. Yeah. We had that infrastructure in Victoria. We had trams. Yeah. We had a, a, an interurban line that ran out to Deep Cove, and yeah. we ripped it all up. And we have the ENN sitting there, steel rails, just waiting for steel steel wheeled vehicles to yeah. run. Extremely efficient. 
and, and we're, we're wasting it. We're letting it rot away. You know, I, where I grew up in New Brunswick, you know, every little village had a siding. Canadian National Railroad ran through yeah. those villages. Yeah. They'd drop off a couple of cars. Mm -hmm. I, when I was a kid, I used to help unload some of that stuff that was in those cars. It was consumer items, all sorts of things. That's how our village got the majority of the product. That's right, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was an everyday occurrence. Nobody really thought too much about it. No. But it was extremely efficient. Yeah. You know, the car would arrive and set in the siding, and over a few days it would get unloaded and things of that nature. But nothing else had to happen. There was no better operators there. There's no, you know, it wasn't taking up a lot of real estate. No, that's right. You don't need a massive parking lot. Yeah, and or, it's a box stuff. car, right? Yeah, so yeah. Um, you could see how, when they were developing this country, how the rails really were a tremendous, tremendous uh, help and a huge effect on forming this country. Exactly. And then there's, there are the, there's the Canadian Pacific and all these companies, but remember all the companies like BC Electric that ran the, the trams in Vancouver and yeah. Victoria. Now, the thing is, too, is that we're talking about steel rails, but then we should be talking about what's powering oh, exactly. those units. Exactly. Why are we using diesel buses? Yeah. Diesel is junk. Yeah. It's junk. Have you... What, I took the bus out to Lankford for years. I worked for the school board. And you're sitting there when two buses pull away from the curb. The racket, the racket is unbelievable. Yeah. Just the roar. Oh. And then you see this big cloud of black crud coming out of the, out of the exhaust. You don't get that. with tro The other thing that besides trams, think about trolley buses. That's sort of an interim, yeah. you know. I mean, they, they're, they're, they work very well in Vancouver, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I know you, uh, you're in the midst of writing a book also, yes. and, and uh, which you're, now, you're calling uh, the car cult Kool-Aid. Kool yeah. Kool -Aid. The idea is like Jim Jones. We, yeah. we, this car cult is causing climate change. Yeah. Number one reason we climate change is going on. All the yeah. parking lots and all the cars and the diesel buses. And yeah. It's so hard for people, I think, who have to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. They prefer to go in a more environmentally friendly way. That's right. That's right. Um, I drive around in a gas-powered yeah, service van like every most day. Most people, yeah, yeah. And uh, and you, you realize that it's it's a personal thing. I mean, I probably could figure out some way to get an electric vehicle, and yeah, yeah. and it probably cost quite a bit and everything. But the thing is that the economics of it really really prohibits me from they take, me taking that step. Mm -hmm. I'm not really being supported in any way. Oh, that's right, that's right. Uh, and uh, we, end, we end up, well, most of us are more or less in my situation. Either you have to drive for work or you're driving to work. The options are just not there for people at the level that would really change behavior, in my yeah, view. Yeah. You know. Well, the, but then you look at a city like, like say, Zurich. Switzerland, a very wealthy, very yeah. wealthy city. The average income in Zurich is much higher than here. And yet all of these rich people, all these, these bankers and yeah. stockbrokers and, and all these business executives, they take trams yeah. to work because the infrastructure is there and because it's clean and it works. And they, they didn't rip it out in the first place like we did. Yeah. And that's the direction we have to go. And you can sit and, and re read a newspaper and take it easy and relax. That's right. You don't have all the stress and the hassle yeah. of, of sitting in a car and everybody, everybody jostling for all this road space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So historically, what are some of the examples where you could see where the cities could have gone to, to uh, trams and to electric uh, infrastructure, mm -hmm. and instead they removed that and, and bought well, the that, automobile? that was... That was all rigged, basically. Uh, yeah. the, the, this fellow, Alfred Sloan, yeah. created, the creator of Modern General Motors, he didn't like competing with trams. Yeah. And, and he went to town, he went, uh, got rid of trams right across the United States, and the little tentacles went up into Canada as well. Yeah. Now, how would they do that? What was the, what was the step by step process? Well, in the States, the, 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 the real turning point was New York City. Yeah called New York Railways on Manhattan. Yeah. Huge system. They got control of it in 1927. Yeah. And it took them a while to jump all the hoops. But 1935, they started ripping out this massive tram system on Manhattan. Yeah. And, and, a, and a year after, they got control of the system in New Jersey. 
Yeah. That was gone. And it was right across the United States. And then this guy, uh, one of their main henchmen, uh, uh, did a report for BC Electric in Vancouver saying, oh, this is great what you're doing. This is wonderful. You're, this, is, this is progress. This is, yeah. you know. <laughs> and it was all a scam. It yeah. was a giant scam over the course of Well, many Vancouver years. still has electric buses, so. Yeah, but they had streetcars, yeah. which are better than, than trolley buses because the old steel on steel. <laughs> There's less. If you can just move more weight on steel than you exactly. can that's on right, rubber. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just it's better. It's more efficient. The other yeah. thing is you can, you can plant grass between the rails. Yeah. And it's, and it's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, you could green, green up the city. You could green up, yeah, exactly. Now, what and, are the chances that we're going to, say, for instance, retrieve uh, the e and rail line? Is there any chance that that might we go don't have, back? We, eventually, we're going to have to face facts and realize that it's, 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 a, it's a huge asset that we're blowing. Yeah. We're, and and we, keep, we keep making the roads wider. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, you know, they're doing 5,000 units of uh, housing out of the Royal Bay, something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a huge development. Yeah. And uh, you could see, see where, okay, you have something that you could actually bring uh, some type of uh, system to that neighborhood. Yeah, you sure could. And, and <laughs> uh, there you have the Ian and Rail Line. Ian and, and you know, yeah. another, another problem in Victoria is Esquimalt Harbor. There, there should be a bridge over the entrance, a tram bridge, over the entrance to Esquimalt Harbor. Right. Because the big problem in Victoria is everything goes around, around Esquimalt that. Harbor. And then this is a huge bottleneck at Thetis Lake, right? Yeah. So why don't we just build a tram bridge, like Sky Bridge in Vancouver, yeah. wouldn't be that expensive, over Esquimalt Harbor, and that would relieve a lot, some of the... the would that be for automobiles or for... I, I, it would be pointless to make it for cars because yeah. the roads are full already. Yeah. Put a tram bridge over Esquimalt, and, and a tram bridge plus bicycles and pedestrians. Yeah. You know. Now, what's uh, like a, a SkyTrain sort of design is something entirely different. Is that not correct? SkyTrain has problems. It's mega expensive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the biggest problem. And, and it locks you into one supplier. Yeah. Uh, whereas with trams, you can buy trams from any company. There's, you know, 20 companies you can buy from. And they're slower moving vehicles too, aren't they? What's that? They, Are they slower moving than the like, SkyTrain? Are they... Uh, well, it, it varies. You, you can you can really pick how fast you want it to be, right? It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. You can have in traffic or or its own little right of way. You know, we we really have to be doing some more in depth sort of analysis outside of allowing our uh, elected officials making these decisions. Nobody's really challenging a lot of their of their decisions because the information is just simply not there for people to... No, there is a lot of bureaucratic inertia, that's, you know, that's for sure. Yeah. So perhaps what you're doing is going to help us out in that, I hope in that so. area. I hope so. yeah. and people can <laughs> kind of get back to thinking about public transportation and how beneficial it is, how great it is for the environment. And also bicycles and, and, and yeah. walking. Those, it's the three, it's the other four, three pieces of the pizza, right? Right. Anyway, so that uh, wraps up this segment of uh, Citizens Forum. Thank you very much for coming in. Okay, well. Welcome back to Citizens Forum. Uh, we often talk about so many topics on this show and, and uh, and many people are expressing quite a bit of frustration. Uh, so often our guests are fr expressing frustration and things that are happening. Uh, Everybody is wishing for change and hoping that we can bring something about that's going to be better. Uh, but it never seems to happen. You know, there always seems to be something that keeps us from getting that prize. So, you know, uh, I have Will with me today, uh, Will Smith, and a new Canadian citizen. And, and also our, our editor and director here in the show. And I was going to ask you, Will, for starters, what do you think, what do you think are the major impediments to, for real change to be brought about in society? Well, thank you for having me on the show again. Uh, I, Jack and I were talking before the show, and, and we, were, we were sort of exploring this idea. And one of the things that comes up is that, you know, we spend all this time talking about these issues and fighting for this thing to happen or that thing and then nothing happens and so people are very frustrated and I just wanted to step back and, and take a look at the whole what's going on with the whole system 
And uh, so I, just as a thought experiment, I started thinking about uh, what these systems really are. Because if you think about it, we elect somebody, but we didn't change a lot of things that were already in the system. So how much inertia does that system really have? If you have all these uh, people involved in government, there's a lot of uh, a lot of inertia. A lot of bureaucracy. A lot of bureaucracy. And the same thing is true in corporations. There's a lot of, of bureaucracy. So, so one of the things we can, we can uh, look at there is how can we expect this to change when we have that, when that, that inertia is built into the system. But then also if we look at the whole system, like I, I was telling Jack, you know, I was raised... I was raised in the in the United States and as a the, the free enterprise system, and uh, there are all these characteristics of the the free enterprise system. And one of the things is that that corporations are very uh, much a part of the the visionary how our our society works. I mean, visions come where we're going in the future from these corporations, right? Yeah. But the corporations have in their charter that they're here to make money. Yeah. And so they don't really care about us. A corporation is this entity that doesn't care about the humans who run it. So let's, let's look at it as if uh, this is artificial intelligence. Because what is artificial intelligence really? Artificial intelligence is a program that's running on a piece of hardware, right? So, yeah. But that's just a, those are, those are uh, concepts. So a program can be the combination of a corporate charter yeah. and all the laws and the money, everything that makes that, allows that to happen. Yeah. And the hardware is, uh, well, the hardware is people, really. And you have the same thing in government. You have all the rules and regulations and laws, but they run, it's running on people. Yeah. But the people aren't really paying attention to where that's headed. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and there have been some pretty cool stories and, and movies about about this situation, if, if you program artificial intelligence to survive, what is it gonna do? Yeah. It's gonna survive. But it may not have enough information to do a good job of surviving. So if we look at, if we look at a plant like uh, mistletoe, mistletoe is a parasite. So yeah. it's like an artificial intelligence that runs on a, on a cottonwood tree, and that's what we have in Arizona, cottonwood yeah. trees that mistletoe grows on. Well, the mistletoe doesn't really know that it's killing the cottonwood tree, right? Yeah. It just grows until it kills the cottonwood tree. Yeah. Well, that's essentially the situation that we have right now is that we have this, these artificial intelligence, these programs that we've set up that run on us, on our hardware, on the earth and, and yeah. ourselves. So, but they're programmed wrong yeah. because they're programmed to just eat us up until, there, until there's nothing left. You know, so, one could argue, I mean, you could argue that corporations, you could say corporations don't care about people, or I might say, well, they don't have to care about people. You know, it's not like they, that they're evil, it's just that they are not being designed to look out after the needs of, of, of the exactly. public and looking after the needs of the community and taking in all the values. Exactly, that, they're self-serving. They, yeah. they want to keep, continue to exist. So, so what I'm saying is though, if we can't step back and say, we need to design these systems, redesign these systems so that they don't blow up and destroy themselves. Because if we've got, if we've got a program in place, that the, simple, the, the object of the program is to create equity, to increase the value of equity for the shareholders. Yeah. It's going to kill all the, the people who work there because that's the prime directive. Yeah. Or you could look at, say, uh, the buffer to the corporate agenda is a good government. And the government says, okay, corporation, you just want to make money. That's okay. We're good with that. But guess what? We're going to tax you in a certain way. We are going to look at and, and, and create regulations to reduce the impact of the pollution that you're that you're creating. We are also going to enforce minimum wage laws and workers' compensation. And but what, what what's happening right now, I think, is because the corporation is so powerful, they can 
invade the government, let's say, they can infiltrate the, the government and, and cover all those ministries that are going to create regulations that are going to govern them, and they can put their own people in there. And therefore, they're robbing from us. I, I My belief is that they're robbing from us a fundamental right that we should have to be able to have input and have a certain level of control over our environment and our work environment. So right. we're, we're in the situation where the corporation's been too successful. Yeah, but the thing is that you're, you're showing this that the system is based on an adversarial. So, I mean, yeah. in, in the U.S., the system has checks, checks and balances, which aren't evidently aren't functioning as well as they might nowadays. But, I mean, what you're saying is there should be a system of of uh, checks and balances, and, it, and it's based on adversarial. So, yeah. I mean, you know, if this person gets out of line, then this person does something. And what we're, I mean, the, the math behind uh, where we need to go is that we need to, to uh, decide, have a, have a, a meeting, yeah. and uh, communicate rather than compete. Or maybe even just not having to meet that quarterly report that corporations could have a different charter uh, and they could be could be measured in more long term. Yeah, it should be measured. You know, the gross national happiness or whatever. You know. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, a, that's a good so point. So I'm just saying that you know, until if we expect the the system to change the way it is right now, it might be a, a tall order. Yeah. Because we've seen over the years. I mean, I, I've only been participating in this show for oh. five years, but I've just seen that you know. We're, we're essentially being Sisyphus. We're trying to push about up a rock up the hill and it's rolling back down on us all the time and it gets old. Well, there are, I find I, there are changes that are good and we've seen some good things happen and there are things that aren't good. And, and, and we see some things like, uh, like say for instance, uh, Donald Trump in the United States where things have seemed, seemingly have really gone off the rails. Yes. Uh, so, in my view, and I, mean, I think it's a corporate agenda that has Donald Trump in office. I think that it's a it's a huge public relations uh, campaign that that they are able to put Trump into power and then maintain this sort of daily sort of uh, uh, it's it's just a soap opera, really, of one. It's thing a reality show. And, and, and meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, of course, all the important things are not being discussed any longer. But, uh, you know, getting back to that idea of, uh, of, you know, it's basically boiling down to what are we going to demand as citizens? And how can we educate citizens to, to look at the world and say, yeah, get involved and you can actually have some input? Well, I... I I'm a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm not optimistic about uh, how this is all going to end. I mean, I, yeah. I think that probably there's more chaos in our future because things aren't, I mean, you can just look at what happened with the legalization of cannabis here. I mean, now that, now that cannabis is illegal, it's completely illegal, right? I mean, there, you can't get it anywhere. So, so I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, just kind of, it's just kind of funny how it, it, what seems to be happening with the system is instead of adapting to an accelerating rate of change, it's slowing down and in some cases just stopping to see what's, you know, what's going to happen. Well, that isn't an answer. I mean, things have to move and we That's all right. have to eat. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I, I just I look at this as we're going to go through something before it settles down into something different, because I don't I don't see that that. Uh, I mean, we'll see what happens with proportional representation. The outcome of the proportional representation vote will be a really key indicator, I think, as to how, how well we can survive and how intact our system will be. Because if we can't, if we can't uh, change it so that the, the, the society that we live in look more, looks more like what people actually want it to look like, then I think we can look for some chaos. And it, you know, I, I'm not advocating chaos. I, I don't like chaos. I like things to run smoothly and uh, society to run well. But that's not what I'm seeing. Well, we are looking at a first-past-the-post system in the United States. And I find it a bit of a joke when they always say that, you know, the premier democracy on the planet, and they, they build themselves as being so fair and, and so concerned. But 
on the ground, there's something entirely different happening. And, and as long as I think when the corporate media can sell uh, enough people on the idea that it is democratic, people really can't figure out the issues of why it's not democratic. You know, nobody's really discussing what's happening in the United States and how the Democrats and Republicans look a lot similar, really. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Democrats might be a little less harmful, but how much less? And nobody's really looking at the fundamental structures that are in American society that that are really taking us into very dangerous territory. Yeah, and it's very, and it would be very hard to change our, these systems. I mean, in, in the United States, it's, it's hard to get a, a straight election. So to completely change the system, you can imagine how difficult that would be, what a fight and how adversarial that would be. Yeah, exactly. I just hope we can, we can do something uh, before, especially with the, as far as the environmental stuff, before we, have a, before we hit some tipping point that we can't get back. That's, that's what I really... And also on the economic side, I mean, the United States is, doesn't have an economy, by the way. They're, they're bankrupt. They're still bankrupt from 2008. They can't pay their, their yeah, debts. Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, anybody's guess. I, I think that uh, there's so much hidden stuff. I, I, I've read it on the show about how balance sheets, uh, annual reports aren't to inform people. They're to hide the facts now. So, yeah. I mean, how can you make intelligent decisions? And, and it seems like we're drifting towards that with, uh, with the way our governments are spending money right now in, in, in yeah. British Columbia. So how are we going to get out of that? Do we get out by changing the system or do we, does the system just fail? That's what we're waiting to see. Yeah, I think the system has to fail. So there's no doubt some about that. Some parts of it at least. It has to. We have to enter some type of a, a greater degree of crisis in order to... Hit a new equilibrium, sort of. To get people going, you yeah. know, uh, whether you like it or not, we have to deal with the major issues of climate change and all the other issues in the planet, and we we got to we got to get past the uh, the sideshow in the United States. So, Will, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us thank today. Thank you. And that wraps up uh, the show for this week, and uh, we'll see you next week.